This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Life is everywhere, and we are connected to it. In the web of life, everything has a purpose and is part of the ecology of the planet. Our dogs help me see all this. It starts with their curiosity, their need to inspect every little thing on a walk and then do it again the next day. Every being has a purpose. Follow a dog or a child. Explore a little. Ask one question, which leads to another and then a whole new world appears before you. Children and dogs. On a walk, the most important thing to do is be curious. We walk for all sorts of reasons. We decompress, we count steps, we listen to music, we make lists. If we are not alone, we talk. Yet, if we follow our dog's nose, If we spend a bit more time wondering about where that plant, that flower, that mysterious jackrabbit, their head and ears peeking out from a bush, came from, and we do it repeatedly, the biosphere emerges before us as astonishing and interconnected. We walk in a sacred space, life connected, life dependent. Nothing stands, walks, runs, creeps, swims, slithers, sends out shoots or roots independently. Every living creature has a past, a history that takes it back to those single-cell ancestors four billion years ago. It is the great oneness. Valeria interviews Hirsch Wilson. He is the author of Dog Lessons, learning the important stuff from our best friends, play to win, choosing growth over fear in work and life, firefighter zen, a field guide to thriving in tough times, and Test of Faith, a novel of faith and murder in the Southwest. Hirsch Wilson has worked, as in jobs he was actually paid for, as a corn pollinator, a Ferris wheel operator, a short order cook, a ballet dancer, an outdoor educator, a soccer coach, a leadership consultant, a pilot, and a writer. The Ferris wheel operating was the strangest job. Lots of physics involved. Along the way, he was also a volunteer firefighter EMT for 33 years, which culminated in the award-winning book Firefighter Zen, a field guide for thriving in tough times. Most importantly, he is the partner of Lori Wilson, father of two daughters and grandfather of two. For over 60 years, he's also been a dog guardian. He has co-written three national business bestsellers with his father, Larry Wilson, including the award-winning Play to Win, Choosing Growth Over Fear in Work and in Life. Hirsch attended Colorado College and quit his junior year to follow his passion, dance. He performed in Canada, Switzerland, and the United States. After that career ended, he graduated with a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. Hirsch and Lori live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with their daughter Sully and two rescue dogs, Toby, a Great Pyrenees, and Maisie, a Terrier Chihuahua mix. His latest book is Dog Lessons, Learning the Important Stuff from Our Best Friends. You can follow on medium.com at Hirsch Wilson, on X, Twitter at Braving Fires, on Instagram at Hirsch Wilson, and on his website, hirschwilson.com. You can order Hirsch's books at your favorite bookstore or wherever books are sold. Or you can go to our wonderful bookstore in Santa Fe, Collected Works, order in person or online. Meet Hirsch at hirschwilson.com. Here's the interview with Hirsch Wilson.
In your own words, who is Hirsch Wilson? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I'm a 74-year-old grandfather, uh, former firefighter. I was a firefighter for 33 years, um, uh, father of two daughters and grandfather of um, um, a granddaughter and a grandson. So that's that kind of um, uh, what's most important in my life right now. Um, and I have been fortunate to kind of follow my dreams no matter what age I've been. So mm -hmm. I think I talk about um, working as a Ferris wheel operator as a, as a young child, yeah. uh, pollinating corn, uh, being a ballet dancer, being a pilot, um, uh, being a facilitator for uh, large organizations. And then um, my most recent endeavor has been writing books. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm curious to know which of these um, roles uh, do you love most? Do you enjoy the most or have enjoyed? Oh, boy. Them? Well, I think um, a dan a dancing was mm -hmm. probably the thing where I used most of my ambition in my life and most of my passion in my life. Yeah. Um, so that I was a dancer from age 19 to <laughs> age 30. Wow. Um, wow. And I think that taught me just how beautiful the arts are, how important the arts are, and it taught me discipline, which was something I, I, I really needed <laughs> and, and helped me throughout the rest of my career. Wow. Was it, what is it about dancing? You know, I usually say that. I actually start almost every, all conversations I have here. Let's dance. It's something mm. that comes naturally to me. It, it's, mm. I know it's coming probably from a spiritual perspective, perception of myself in the world, that we hear everything here is just moving, dancing, as the universe intelligence and doing what it does. Yes, I, I think dancing, uh, I think you have to go back and realize that as human beings, we've always danced. Mm, yeah. um, we've danced for joy, we've danced for sorrow, we've danced for all sorts of reasons. Mm. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, I think our Western culture um, has eliminated or, or disrespects not only the spirituality aspect of it, but yeah. but the idea of dancing. Uh, um, part of that is uh, in America is because of our our puritanical roots, where you know if you're if you're a true pur puritan, you never want to see anybody having any fun. Uh -huh. um, and I think. Um, yeah. I think that's really influenced us because I think dancing, I think there is a time, in, and I think this is true for all artists, where you get so subsumed in the dance, so subsumed in movement mm. that you forget who you are mm. and you just become the music, you become mm. the dance. Yeah. And that is a that to me is probably mm. one of the highest spiritual mm. experiences you can have. Wow. Oh, yes, a billion times to that truth. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 becoming the dance itself. Ah, yes. How wonderful. I didn't expect to hear that from you, of course. Mm, that's a very mm. um, powerful, sure. empowering, and uh, truth with capital T well, I, yeah. <laughs> to me. I think, it, I think <laughs> one of the things I've, I've come to realize is that we are many things. Mm. We are not just our career. We're not just our job. We're not just our roles, parent or daughter or son, we are many, many things. Yeah. Um, and part of life, the journey of life is discovering all those aspects of ourselves yeah. and, and celebrating them and worship, worshiping them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've had the, the, the pleasure and the opportunity to do that. Mm, wow. Yes. What a beautiful metaphor uh, for life itself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. That dancers, artists in general, you said, but specifically dancers, they at some point, they forget who they are, and only the movement mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. remains um, as life moves. I think that you, itself. right? And I've had the same experience as a firefighter, where as a firefighter and a, a medic, an EMT, yeah. uh, you become so involved with your team in solving somebody else somebody else's worst day of their lives mm -hmm. that you forget who you are, mm -hmm. you forget yourself because mm -hmm. you're you're so involved in serving somebody else. Mm. And it's just somewhat the same thing. Yes. Where you get out of that, e you, you, you lose your ego, you forget your ego, mm. you're there for somebody else or you're there for a higher purpose. Mm. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so that's to say that the only thing that really aspect of us that separates us from life itself, 
universe, God, whatever we call that, is really thinking. It's belief systems, right, Hirsch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really is. It's Absolutely. Believing that we are Absolutely. Yeah, and a separate entity. In the yeah. Individual. Ah, yeah. how did you come to this uh, realization by experience itself or Buddhism? I know you're also a, um, a beginner uh, Buddhist. Right. I think I came to it, I think firefighting, um, being a firefighter for 33 years taught me that, um, that I, th I think when you experience people in, in their worst moments, when they need help, mm. uh, you realize a couple of things. You realize one that we all need help. We all need support right. that, um, as human beings, human beings are not meant to be individuals alone in the world. Um, we are communal beings. We are, we need social support. Um, and that's where we get our highest meaning. The idea of the Lone Ranger and John Wayne uh, and the kind of the American individual idea is, is myth. It's illusion, really. And I think you learn, as a firefighter, you learn that quite quickly mm -hmm. that we need each other. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a beautiful lesson right there. You know, I know um, you wrote a book, yeah, Firefighter Zen, right? A field of guide, Correct. driving in right. tough times. Is that where you... Um, do you talk about this philosophy there uh, openly? Yes. Yeah, this sounds very spiritual yes, to yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, that's why you yeah. call firefighters then. I didn't read that book. Right, right. Uh, I think I think Buddhism, yeah. Buddhism is just, there's, I think we all need structure. I think we all need a belief system. And I think we spend so much time looking for the perfect one that we forget that, uh, that perfection is the enemy of the good. Uh, and to me, Buddhism um, aligned with my existing belief systems and, and taught me, I think, the most important lesson that you learn as the firefighter, but really enforce, uh, reinforces it with Buddhism. And that's the idea of being kind. That um, yeah. to the extent we can be kind in the world, we really give back to this to the world mm. um and it, it doesn't take it doesn't take a whole lot of effort we have to again we have to mm. move our ego out of the way right. uh, and just say i'm going to be kind no matter how people treat me mm. my mission is to be kind and whether you're christian or muslim mm. or buddhist that me message resonates across most religions mm, yes that's fundamental yes right the, the mm -hmm. message of love and the message that right. there is something beyond the human existence i think that's uh, mm -hmm. all religions right they they mm -hmm. point to that mm -hmm. yes um it's, it's kindness that's one of my guiding principles um but i have had some challenges with that concept and applying it sure is that there was trying to be nice i guess some people they call it you know being nice instead of kind so I was trying just too hard to please others but then saying yes when i really meant to say no so that was hurting right. me right. i was not really in a good place right Right. So I think yeah. as a firefighter, because you, you as in firefighting and, and emergency medical services, you're always dealing with difficult people. Right. It just comes with the job. Right. And a lot of it is, you know, we, we're going through uh, a kind of an epidemic of uh, mental illness in this country right now yeah. and drug abuse yeah. and then dealing with people with trauma. They're, stri they're stripped. Their, their ability to be you know, socially appropriate is gone. So we have the saying in the fire department, first try to be kind. Mm. And then if you can't be kind, be nice. Mm. Right? Um, nice. And that's kind of what we teach people coming into it because it's, it's very easy if someone's yelling at you, if someone's screaming at you, if someone uh, hits you or strikes you, it's very easy to strike back and hit back. But we, we really as professionals yeah. – um, mm want to be kind and want to be if can't be kind be nice mm. and can't be if can't be nice be respectful mm, i see yeah so there's um it's almost like steps to it <laughs> uh i like that right. i never heard it right. that way mm. yeah yeah and i think yeah. one i think one big example that goes on every day in, in the emergency services yeah. is how we treat people who are uh, struggling with addiction if i think addiction uh, to heroin or fentanyl is a moral choice, right? Yeah. And I get paid at four o'clock in the morning to go see the same ad addict for the fourth or fifth time this month. I'm going to get upset and mad. But if I understand that addiction is a disease, right? If it's not something that somebody willingly wants to do, but yes. it's a disease, yes. then it allows me to be more compassionate. 
So how I think about the world, how I, how I choose to show up in the world is super important um, for how I end up treating people. Mm, yes, and that, uh, that choice comes from belief systems, right, Hirsch? Because we are just acting out our beliefs here. And, Absolutely. Yeah, and I think one of, one of them is to believe that we are the body only. I love what you said about yeah, if you can be kind, then be nice. And if you can be nice, be respectful. And then that's mm -hmm. something that I, this week I kind of um, had this insight into gratitude. So I had a lot mm -hmm. of uh, issues happening here. The, the time changed with the daylight savings. And then it was right. just, oh gosh, <laughs> my mind was all over the place. I couldn't sleep well. And then we had a roof. Um, what do you call roof um, remodeling, like in the, in the neighbor's oh, house? Right. Gosh, it was so like chaotic. And then I, I just reflected on, I'm not happy. I'm not, I can't be loving right now. I can't be kind. What else can I be? And then what came to me was grateful. I'm grateful to be alive. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to be able to mm -hmm. hear even the noise, mm -hmm. be able to perceive mm -hmm. chaos. So mm -hmm. what is your take on gratitude? I think... Uh, we, my, my daughter who lives with us, yeah. uh, she's 30 yeah. and she makes us do a gratitude exercise mm -hmm. every night. Mm -hmm. Um, just to, just to think about what we're grateful for this day. Um, and I look at it and I, it's a simple thing, just like hearing my daughter and my wife laugh together, uh, makes me incredibly grateful. <laughs> yes. Um, knowing, knowing that in my, in my, my family right now, um, everybody's alive Everybody's healthy. Um, I'm enormously grateful. So I, I think um, I think part of it starts with understanding what your expectations are, and if your expectations are, are attached to reality, which a lot of ours, ours are not, but if they're attached to reality, knowing that everybody's healthy and alive and have careers and are loved, that to me is. Uh, it can't get better than that. It just can't get better than that. Mm. Um, and I, I, I know yeah. I'm, I'm from a spiritual point of view, I think of it this way. Um, for all of us who are born, there lies an infinity of time, billions and billions and billions of years. And after we pass away, the same thing. It's infinity, billions and billions and billions of years that we're here on this um, blue green planet, uh, on an outside perimeter of the Milky of the Milky Way, is astonishing. It's a miracle. Yes. Uh, it de yes. And it depends on you know how. Uh, no matter how you define miracle, from a spiritual sense or a physics sense, it's just extraordinary. And so once you understand that and, and you and you grasp the reality of our being, to me, it's it's just. Like every day is like, oh my God, I'm alive. I cannot believe I'm alive. Um, and I think that's kind of where I come from fundamentally. I have bad days, just like everybody has bad yes. days. Um, and, you know, days where you don't want to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. The only people you want to talk, well, the only beings you want to talk to are your dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. But but behind that is that extraordinary experience of being alive in in an in, in incredibly vast and timeless universe. Ah, that's truly beautiful. Gosh, her shoes just have so much timeless wisdom that um, I don't even know where to begin now, how to continue the conversation. <laughs> I mean, like, ah, amazing. I love that. Uh, I love everything about it. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing your heart. Um, let me just wait a moment. It's interesting. Noise has been my uh, the theme this week here. <laughs> noise mm, everywhere, yeah. and I have been, you know, asking for truth that in any moment, like, please, what's the, what can I, um, what can I see here? What am I to see? What um, and in you know, grat gratitude was one of them. And it's interesting that mm -hmm. um, you you talk so much about it now in a very profound spiritual way. Uh, we wish for everyone to to be able to live this truth, right? That um, this is a miracle to be here. And mm -hmm. I think compassion, you spoke of compassion earlier in the Buddhism, they teach a lot of that. It comes, I mean, it comes in handy when you just see other people suffering 
out of this belief system that they um, their life is suffering, their life is mm. not good. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at somebody, my husband, yeah, about a, a week ago, something happened and I think he said something negative towards himself, like a set negative self-talk. And immediately something in me got very emotional, like, oh, I wish he only knew how, mm. how complete and whole um, you are already how this is what you're looking for, that you are what you're looking for. And and that made me cry because um, you. I don't think those we can teach those things. I don't know, Hirsch, mm. do you? Um, I have these conversations with you all the time, but it, the world doesn't seem to change that much. Uh, people around me, they, they seem to be no. the same way. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the most important tenets of Buddhism is that there's suffering in life, yeah. um, and um, that's and if you look around, um, whether you look at the history of humanity or whether you look at our present moment in time, there's enormous suffering. Whether it's in yeah. Sudan, yeah. in Israel, or Gaza, or anywhere right now, there's suffering, um, and and so then the question becomes, um, what do we do about that? Mm. How do we react to the suffering in the world? Right. And I think um, religion, Christianity and Judaism, which is what I'm most familiar with, yeah. call out for us to help solve suffering and to help, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think Buddha said that um, the ability to, to end the suffering of one person, and, and the same in Talmud, Ending suffer the suffering of one person and you save the world. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. my yeah. my I think and I think as a firefighter, that's mm-hmm. that's how my response to that is being a firefighter and and being there for people in their need. But I think I think we all can do better. I think we all can do more. And 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 not a lot. It doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot. Right. It just takes us to say, how can how can I be kind today? Um, Robin Williams, who I, I love, the comedian, who was one of my favorite people on the planet, um, committed suicide. And But one of the things he said was that you know, we all have to remember that everybody has a story. Mm. Everybody has something going on in their, in their life and that it's, you look at them and you wonder, how can they even stand up, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and once you come to that realization that everybody's got suffering in their life, it's much easier to be kind. Mm. And it's much easier to follow the impulse to, to say, how can I help? Mm-hmm. I think, how can I help is probably the most profound mm-hmm. spiritual phrase we can offer mm-hmm. as human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's getting outside of ourselves mm-hmm. and saying, my role is, I'm, I'm here to help other people. That's, that's my role in existence. And I think whether whatever spiritual tradition you come from, that resonates. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that too. Yes, I have heard that phrase in a, in a well, with a, another part of it coming before that, somebody said, I think it was uh, one of the monks that I listened to, when I close my eyes, I'm at peace. And when I open my eyes, the question is, how can I help? Mm, so that, that's lovely. Yeah, that's lovely. I think it was a Zen, uh, a Zen monk who said that. Yeah. And I think what's important is we need both. We need to be able to close our eyes and have tranquility yeah. um, because it's a pretty chaotic place out there in the world. <laughs> yes, gosh, <laughs> you know? this week, and, I could tell you. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, directly. I know. And, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we need those moments of tranquility. And then at the same time, we, I, I, I think um, I always have thought that the, the, the way to kind of um, a true life is not solely through meditation mm. and not solely by putting yourself on the mountain. There was a story about a Buddhist monk, not Buddhist, but it's a monk who just passed away last week, uh, who, who um, had never seen a woman in his entire life, right? Um, and I think, I think that's, there are, there are many ways to, to kind of a whole life. But in my view, the way to a whole life is by helping others, by being engaged. Um, and and I, th- I think um, that's kind of my motivation every day is how can I, what can I do to help? Whether it's 
whether it's helping people or whether whether it's helping dogs, mm -hmm. what can I do today? Yes, oh, gosh, yeah, um, yes, helping dogs, yeah. But I love the way you said that too. That uh, everyone at some level it's going through challenges, um, it's suffering somehow. Yes. Even it could be yeah. just the, at the body level, right? The body's always doing something. Right. That might not be well. Right. Yes. Yes. How can I help? Um, what a profound message for all of us, not just to be in touch with for the first time, but as a reminder. That was a big reminder for mm -hmm. me just now. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I want to thank you for that, Hirsch, as a spiritual message. Sure. Um, you mentioned, gosh, um, I want to, we want to talk about the dog lesson book, but I have another question. Uh -huh. You're just so interesting. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. You mentioned Robert Williams, right? Um, he was um, very much engaged in that role, being an actor in being helping others, being funny, bringing joy and all, but he was not well. So I wish you have, I, I wonder how, how this is possible uh, for some of us not to be well, and not even to be able to recognize a lot of times that we're not well. I wonder why, how can this happen um, when we seem to be doing so well um, helping others? How can we not be helping ourselves first? Um, it's a really good question. I think you step back for a minute. A lot of us are taught, uh, and this is kind of one of the, the um, kind of, negative consequences of stoicism that we're, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not supposed to talk about our pain. Right. We're not supposed to admit that we're, we suffer. Right. Um, we're just supposed to kind of grin and bear it, um, carry on, carry mm -hmm. forth. And yeah. I think, I mean, I suffer from that all the time because I, you know, I have a, mm -hmm. a Catholic upbringing and I had, uh, and, and kind of because I'm an American male, mm -hmm. stoicism is kind of built into the system. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think, I think we have to understand we have to take care of ourselves. And when we take care of ourselves, when we're healthy, when I think both of you, you and I talked before we started recording about how tired we are mm. because of daylight savings time, mm, gosh, yeah. right? And <laughs> yes. so we need, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to be rested. Mm. We need to eat well. Um, and, and when we can do all those things, then we're better able to help others. Mm. It's very hard to help others when you are suffering. Mm. Yes, yeah. Although, although in the in the tradition in the, in the Christian tradition, um, suffering, Christ on the cross, uh, here to save us all, comes with is part of the package of Catholicism and Christianity. So right, sacrifice. Oh, there are my dogs. Oh yes, of course they they have to be here. We'll be talking about them. Um, Right, so the right. idea of sacrifice, my Hirsch, yeah, right. I know in Christianity that's a big, a very big theme, which I never subscribed right. to. For so, intuitively, no, I never either. really um, understood that. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't make sense to me. But um, nope, nope. But also <laughs> the idea. It seems like it is. It is that it goes back to the the concept of balance, isn't it? Loving ourselves yes. and others at the same time. Um, right bringing those two pieces together, which it sounds to me like um, the pro byproduct of wisdom it really does. Yes, yes. It's, I think the idea of balance is really what we strive for. Don't you think? I mean, it's the ability to take care of ourselves and be kind in the world. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. And I, I remember being reluctant to this idea of balance because life felt to me there was never really the balance was not a destination a place to to come mm -hmm. and stay and live there because it's a it might be that um the other idea that i have heard that made more sense to me that dynamic a balance something that mm. uh, this uh, it's always moving as we talked earlier about dancing so it's a uh, always finding a way of dancing gracefully um, I mm -hmm. think that's knowing the steps, perhaps, right? Like getting to know the steps of a, a song and and kind of always returning to it, uh, having that memory, mm -hmm. uh, the body memory. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that kind of makes more sense for me. Dynamic, moving mm -hmm. balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your book. So dog lessons, learning the important stuff from our best friends. Um, the first question is, what was the main intention of writing your book? This book. I think it was twofold. One, it was um, an opportunity for me to express my gratitude mm -hmm. to having lived with dogs yeah. uh, my, since I was 10 years old. Yeah. 
I think secondly, it is um, to help people wake up and understand what an amazing gift dogs are in our lives. Um, they are, they were the first domesticated species. And I, I don't like the word domesticated really, yeah. but they were the first species to, uh, that we encountered as, as homo sapiens 40,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago, no one's really sure. And we became partners. Um, and, and we have been partners for that, for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And I think sometimes, and maybe it's just me that we take that for granted. But when you look at a dog, mm -hmm. you're looking at generations, generations of dogs going back f far into time mm -hmm. that have been with us, whether we were hunter gatherers, whether we were uh, agriculture or living in cities, dogs have always been with us. Yes. And I, I think I wanted to tell that story so that, so that we don't take them for granted. Mm -hmm. I think the other part. Yes. How beautiful. Yeah. The, you see the concept of gratitude, right? That it, it comes, mm -hmm. came to life now to, to this conversation in this way. Yes. Um, for me has been um, having a dog and actually looking at anything that cannot, that we could easily hurt if we chose to. That to me is a mm. practice of compassion, isn't it? Um, being able mm. to see yes. that everything is interconnected, that life is one. Yes. As you said beautifully in your book, you did mention that, which is another spiritual theme, the oneness of life, being able to see that. Right. Live that. It's, I, think that, I think the idea, whether you take it from a, a position of ecology or, or from a more spiritual position, we're all, everything's connected on this planet. There's a saying that you, you in, in ecology that you can't change one thing because um, mm. it's so deeply connected. Mm. And mm. I think I live by that every day. It's, mm. it's like um, whether, what, you know, you, you, go on, you go on a walk. And I think one of the things I talk about a lot about is just walking with dogs. Yeah. And you go on a walk and if, you, if you're open and intentional about it, you don't have your uh, iPhone on, uh, you're not on the phone, you're not thinking of other things, but you're just observing, you're seeing the world. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, I, I feel bad for people who live mm -hmm. in cities on, on concrete, but when you get out into the country and, and, and you see the, 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 the amount of life there is, whether it's insects, whether it's birds, mm -hmm. whether it's plant life, you just get the sense that this is an astonishing place to be. And it's all connected. It's all, and we're right now we're responsible for that for that world. Yes, right. And um, hurting, it, it goes back to that message. I think is a Christian message about uh, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So hurting yes. anything outside that seems to be outside of us is hurting ourselves uh, indirectly. That world. right. And there's there's a, a, a Muslim sect, the Janus, uh, J A N I S, and they deeply believe that they cannot hurt another being. Mm. So uh, when they walk, they make mm. sure they're not stepping on insects, right? right? Yeah. Um, and they're very protective of the world. It's, it's a little extreme for us, yeah. but it's, it's an awfully amazing principle to live up to. To my, my responsibility in the world is, is not to bring harm to any being. Yes, wow. Yes, I love that. That's one, uh, I, when I was studying Buddhism, I remember that, that was one of the themes too. Yes, one of the messages, mm -hmm. practices, mm -hmm. not to hurt anything. Yep. Um, yes, which, and I remember trying to really go deeper into that in the sense of living that truth. And I kind of think that I've hurt myself again because I became a vegetarian. I didn't want to eat the animals. Mm -hmm. And then I became mm -hmm. sick from it because I mm. couldn't, I, I need some of the nutrients. Um, from yes, animals. you need the protein, you bet. Yeah, so yeah. that was interesting to see. Another uh, part of that that I realized is that um, in order to be here, um, have this body, I think we're already killing so much. We have caused so much pain. I think we are made mm. up of lots of, of lots of bacteria. We are killing them all the time too, like those microorganisms mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know um, if that's uh, realistic, possible. Not no, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I don't think it's realistic. I think it is, it's one of those things like, aha, uh -huh, here's how another group of people live, yeah. right? I can't live up to that standard, but how can it teach me in my life 
what I can do better. Mm, yes, right. Because and, and yes, so yes. so because because I'm involved yeah. with dogs. Yeah. Right, and um, I, I, and you know, like seven hundred about seven hundred thousand dogs. Is it one point six million dogs going to shelters every year because right. they're unwanted, and a lot of those dogs are euthanized. Mm. Um, and and we just we just seem as a society to ignore that, right? right. Um, and so our, my wife's and my mission is to really bring awareness to that, mm. to help with the shelters, mm. um, because it's it's our callousness sometimes leads to suffering, yes. and and our, our unattention and our lack of mm. our lack of awareness mm. leads to suffering mm. in a lot of ways with with sentient beings. Mm. And I think we have a responsibility. Um, I think it was um, Gandhi, Gandhi who said, you can tell the emotional maturity of a country by how they treat their animals. Right. And we have a long ways to go. Wow, so true. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the, the sections in your book that caught my attention the most. Um, it's the walking mm. in, the, in the universe, which you, you mentioned earlier about walking how <clears throat> with a dog. How wonderful it is! I was laughing when you talked mm-hmm. about them that they always see something new. <laughs> they actually go. You can take them always. on the same path, right. but they always find something. <laughs> they might sniff yes. on the same place, but they, it's if, for them. It's like ah, oh, how interesting to be here and just be smelling this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> same thing. Exactly. Right. And then you also and we can we can have the same awareness. We can mm. we can we can learn to have the same kind of attention. Yes. Yeah. What a beautiful reminder. Yes, 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 a billion times again. And then um, you say in the book, you say, it is important to remember that shelters are not a dog problem. They are a human problem. And then you say, right. here are some actions and standards I try to hold myself to. And then you mention them. So our pet have moral standing, so we cannot treat them like property. That's not treating dogs like property. Also, dogs, all pets, are a lifetime commitment. Ah, that's a big one, mm-hmm. right, Hirsch? What a, mm-hmm. a beautiful reminder mm-hmm. for some of us who just get pets for the sake of, I don't know, it's almost, some people feel like, oh, I don't, I'm sad, just all get a dog. But then mm-hmm. they, they have no idea what's, um, what, are the, uh, what commitment they are making. It's not just because you're sad that you need a dog. There's so much. It's about, it's about them, too, not just about us. And then mm-hmm, you mentioned, exactly. if possible, try to adopt dogs from a shelter, which we didn't do, my husband and I. We got from a breeder. Um, mm-hmm. And I see that in our neighborhood here in Florida. Most people, they have shelter dogs. Uh, and then my husband and I always wondered why. Uh, because needed, right? So people, that's, they're aware of that. So that's a wonderful thing to see around here. And then you talked about uh, uh, newly uh, adopted rescue animals require patience. Uh, it takes time mm. to, to six time for a terrified animal to adjust to a new new humans. True, and then also volunteering. Volunteering, you propose that too as a suggestion. That would be a wonderful thing. To right, do. right. And I, I think the I think I get asked a lot what was the biggest lesson that I wanted to impart about dogs, and I think. Uh, with with especially with shelter dogs is the resilience of dogs i mean we're uh, i i grew up learning that the first three months of a, of a puppy's life set their behavior in stone for the rest of their life mm-hmm. and what you learn working with rescue dogs is they're much more resilient yeah. if you're patient if you're kind a dog that's frightened that's traumatized mm-hmm. and most dogs are traumatized in shelters but if you give them the time they become incredible companions. Mm, yes. Um, and because they're resilient, they're resilient. They can bounce back from hard times. Right. And so, so us human as well, humans, we can, we have that ability. So it's almost like we are, by teaching them or by helping them, we can actually, actually that reflects on us too. It helps us to become more resilient. Exactly, exactly. That's one of yep. the dog lessons I have that here that caught my attention, resilience. And you actually, you, you're very practical too. So it's not, I mean, I love how philosophical you are, how spiritual you are. Um, I mean, I, I just love that because I love phil- philosophy, especially f- spiritual philosophies. But then I see that you're very practical too in giving suggestions. Uh, here you, you 
he mentioned um, six ways you can help foster resilience in your dog. And then you um, suggest active coping, uh, physical exercise, positive attitude, social support, patience, and help from experts. So all these actually mm -hmm. we can apply to ourselves in a way. Exactly. So it exactly. goes both ways, right? right? Yep. And Absolutely. I love how you call yourself also a, a dog guardian. Um, that caught my attention. So in a way you're protecting them. It's not just that dogs, are, you know, some people, they acquire dogs just to protect their house. They leave them outside, mm -hmm. which I really don't subscribe mm -hmm. to that. The idea of having my dog outside mm -hmm. of my house. Um, right. They, they are, they are, he, Zen is part of my family. We consider him almost like a son. Oh, you know, we actually talk to him that, that way. <laughs> we we right. never had right. children. So he's like, oh, he's our son. Right. Right. Same with us. Our dogs are part of our family. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so resilience. Another um, dog lesson that you mentioned in the book that caught my attention was bravery. And, and, that, and I absolutely love the, the way you write. I mean, you're a great writer. You're such a, an amazing writer. That kind of reflects oh, back you. to us. I, I kept thinking about humans, you know, dogs, humans. Yes, that can be applied to, I mean, they are teaching us, but in a in way... Um, by helping them, by helping dogs, we're helping ourselves. It goes back to that fundamental truth again. It's everything is interconnected. So mm -hmm. you talk about bravery in a sense of um, that dogs are brave. Then and then you say, uh, <clears throat> it takes um, where? Yeah, you ask a question. Um, what is the bravest, the bravest thing I can do? So as a question. Then, um, then you said, being brave is not just being, uh, it's, it's not just about courage but going beyond anxiety and fear. So that's another beautiful, beautiful reminder that dogs, they do that automatically all the time. They put themselves in that mm -hmm. position and we can do it too. So you say it in that way. I'm paraphrasing you here, but that's the message that I mm -hmm. received from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a comment about that bravery? That's uh, why well, we need to hear sure. more about bravery, I, all of us. Right, right. <laughs> I, I think, I think, um, just like dogs, I think we are inherently brave. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a legacy. Generations and generations of our forefathers were astonishingly brave. And that they passed that gift on to us. Now, sometimes uh, we, we don't believe it because the, sometimes the whole point of civiliza civilization is that we don't have to demonstrate our bravery because things are taken care of. For, are taken care of by by civilization mm -hmm. and so we lose touch with our bravery mm -hmm. um yeah. but it's there and i think mm -hmm. my recommendation was and, and it's, it's simple things it's simple things think of your day think of um all the things that you want to do but are, are frightened to do yeah. right whether it's, it's telling somebody you love them mm -hmm. whether it's it's things like mm -hmm. admitting you're you were wrong yeah. um all kinds of things mm -hmm. that are little things every day Choice, point, choice points that we come up to. Mm -hmm. And my, what, what I ask is that, um, ask, ask yourself, what are, in this situation, what is the bravest thing I can do? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What is the bravest thing I can do? Um, and that just gives you a guidepost to your actions every day. Because mostly, mostly we strive for comfort yeah. every day. If we're on automatic pilot, we make the, we make the choices that, that seemed to be the most comfortable choice, yeah. not necessarily the right choice. Yeah. And sometimes we can we can choose to be uncomfortable by choosing to be brave. And that's when we grow as a human being because we said that wasn't that hard. Yeah. I can do that again, right? Mm -hmm. And I, so I, I really I really ask the question, um, what is the bravest thing I can do? Yeah. And th that becomes a mantra. Yes, right. That really th that did exactly that for me in that moment. Uh, and, and I mm -hmm. love the way you said that too. Even the, having the courage to say I'm sorry to somebody um, or mm -hmm. saying many times, just telling them how much you love them, not being shy mm -hmm. about it. So I have heard mm -hmm. that exactly that before in um, the same message. It's not having less fear, but having more courage. So it's not about becoming right, exactly. fearless, but having more courage. No, no, no. I, I think fear is a good thing. Yeah, right? Fear keeps us alive, <laughs> yeah. but sometimes fear is irrational. Yes, yes. Yeah, it can get in the way. It can really, really it can get, right, yeah. stop us 
from living the life that we are here to live. Um, right. And um, that's a powerful message uh, that we can all um, we can, we can, it really resonates with all of us. It's something that I have noticed here after interview so many people. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing mm -hmm. that you said, when you say, oh, yeah, I love the way you say, uh, every being has a purpose. That was within the walking in the universe. That also mm -hmm. caught my attention. Every being has a purpose. And it goes back, of course, to the, the theme of everything is interconnected and everything is doing, like dancing this universal dance. Um, that it couldn't really happen without one another. Even the microscopic um, um, organisms, they are playing a role here mm -hmm. that we cannot even, mm -hmm. we, we, cannot, we don't think of and we don't even think about it, most of us. But um, right. what a beautiful contemplation um, to have. Right. Right. I, I, the way evolution and nature work uh, is that. Uh, Everything here is here to grow. Everything and everything is connected. Um, and and as you understand evolution more, and you understand how nature works more, it's just it's it's just astonishing how connected things are, and how dependent everything mm. is. Um, yes. And yeah, that's that that again. It, it's about paying attention. My favorite my favorite poet uh, Mary Oliver talks about be out in nature. Um, notice things pay attention and then tell everybody mm. right and <laughs> I, I think i think yeah. <laughs> right i think um, i think our first yeah. our first objective is to really pay attention yeah yeah pay attention and that's because we don't we seem to live in um in different realities all of us and oh yes. right and we yes. are we are not all, often we are not present. We are in the past or in the future. Uh, we are actually operating through the mind most of the time, not really mm. realizing that there is something else behind, besides the logical and rational thinking mind. There's awareness. I think that's what you're pointing mm -hmm. to. And I'm not sure if we can call it awareness. That might be the closest um, word or concept we mm -hmm. can arrive at. But would you do you agree with that, Hersh? That the word would be or oh, intuition, perhaps too. I don't know. Right. I th I think um, where I kind of come from is that we um, civilization. You, you have to go back. So for millions of years, we were hunter gatherers, yeah. um, and that's how we evolved. And, and that's that's at core who we are. We're social bonding right. mammals, right. right? And civilization. I mean, agriculture has only been around for 15,000 years and our civilization cities like we live in are, are, are a kind of really recent, only a couple of hundred years old. Um, yeah. But the core who we are is that hunter gatherer. And you mm -hmm. take a hunter gatherer at, and you put them on a, at a train station with millions of people and people mm -hmm. on their phones and mm -hmm. all this going on. It's at some level, it's very strange, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it, it doesn't really... Is is I don't know if it's not if I, mm. in one way civilization brings us health you know, we we live longer all those kinds of things mm. but I think it also does damage to our intuitions it also does damage mm. to our, our core being who's who evolved to be in a small tribe as a hunter gatherer and and knowing everybody in the world right yeah. as a hunter gatherer you knew everybody in the universe mm. and now we're confronted with if if you know you're confronted in a city with thousands of strangers yeah. whose intentions you don't know. Mm. And that's hard. That's mm. difficult for us. Mm. And we, we, we kind of push it down because we're told this is the way we should be, but it is foreign. It's strange for us. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That also resonates true to me that we are trying to adapt to an environment that we are actually, we can't biologically, we're not wired for. Um, but I, exactly. I wonder what's the, uh, the alternative to that. Did we have actually an option? Because it seems like that's the way it has been um, human. The human race has evolved. Um, sure. It's growing so much that um, it seems mm. like that was the solution, right? The, for the problem, creating more jobs and um, technologically we are so yeah. advanced in all the food industry. So I'm wondering if we had an option to not to come to this point of disconnection. Um, that's a really good question. And it's hard. I think it's a really difficult, it's not a difficult question, but it's how do we put, how do we honor who we are 
um, and live in a, in a modern industrial society. Right, right, right. And I think a lot of it has to do with family, um, to be, to stay connected to your family. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and to, to have friends. I, I think one of the things that's going on now is that we have this epidemic of loneliness. Yes. And I, a lot, I think the pandemic has a lot to do with that, that we are isolated mm-hmm. uh, in our homes. And I, I can't imagine, I just can't imagine if I wasn't married and I didn't have kids mm-hmm. and I lived in an apartment by myself yeah. for those year and a half, that year and a half or that two years, yeah. how difficult that would have been. So I think this, mm-hmm. the response is, the answer to your question is, we need to stay close to family. We need to have close friends. Um, we need to be active in communities. I mean, those three things, I think, are the are kind of the anecdote to the industrial world we live in. Yes. Yeah. That's a, a beautiful suggestion that I absolutely wholeheartedly agree. Yes. Um, and I think you mentioned that to community support. Oh, you do. So, yes, yeah, social support um, and asking for help when we need help. Mm-hmm. A lot of us have lost that ability to, for some reason, to, to be mm-hmm. humble, right? Um, wow, mm-hmm. we're almost at the end, and I have so many other questions here and um, messages that caught my attention in your book. There is something that you say, oh, you quoted somebody in your book, a French novelist uh, that I, I didn't know about him, um, Milan Kundera, his name? Oh, yes. Oh, my Mila God, Kundera, I yeah. love that yeah. quote. It's under uh, Philosophy of Dog in your book. You say, dogs are our link to paradise. They don't know evil or Mm -hmm. jealousy or discontent. To sit with a dog on the hillside on a glorious afternoon is to be back in Eden, where doing nothing was not boring. It was peace. Uh, Isn't that wonderful? It's such a lovely, lovely line. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Wow. That just, yeah, I was uh, in contemplation for a while after reading this. And I'm I'm still now, Mm. kind of pauses me. Yes, uh, dogs are a link to paradise, right? Mm. They really mm. are. I, and I think yeah. I think of coming home after a long day, sitting on the couch, yeah. and both our dogs jump up on the couch <laughs> yeah. and put their heads on my lap. Oh, yeah. And it's just the most wondrous, peaceful time <laughs> to, you know, to know that they unconditionally love you, no matter what kind of day you've had, um, whether you're rich or poor, successful or fail, or what we call a failure. They're there for you, and they just want their heads under your lap, mm-hmm. and it's wonderful. Yes, very simple. Yes, right. That's it. That's uh, so the the concept here, the idea, the message was simplicity, and you do have mm. in your book you do talk about that. Oh, I can't find it now. Oh, yes, I think I did make. Yeah, yes, under um, a dog lesson, keep it keep it simple. That's where you mentioned that. Mm-hmm. You say if our goal is happiness, the way is probably a simple life. Dogs gives us mental signals. Take me for a walk. Rub, rub my belly. <laughs> feed me. Life is good. Right. <laughs> that, that put a smile on my good. face. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Rub my belly, right. especially. Right. I'm like, wait a minute. Right. When was the last time I had my right. belly rubbed? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Ah, that's yep. beautiful. Hmm. We forget about these things. Um, mm-hmm. So I love the loving kindness, of course. That's um, informed by Buddhism. The way you talk, you mm-hmm. actually talk a lot about that. And you mentioned how to practice the meditation. Actually, you go through the process. So you say love, loving kindness is the first heart practice of Buddhism. Uh, in Buddhism, it is called metta. Uh, practicing metta is a two-step process. <clears throat> so that would be wonderful if you, if you um, could disclose that, share that w- w- on this podcast. Um, Hirsch, huh. that two-step yeah. process. So now I have to remember. Yeah, if you remember. Right. If you remember. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I remember. So I, I think of it, I think the first process is awareness. Yeah. It's just awareness of me and the world. Um, and, and, and sometimes that takes meditation, which is a very powerful tool, obviously. And for me, it's, it's a, again, I go back to being out with my dogs in the wilderness, walking with my dogs. Um, and that that brings me back, kind of grounds me in the simple simplicity, and the idea. And then I think the idea of loving kindness emerge, loving part of it emerges immediately when I'm with my dogs. I love our dogs, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're the manifestation of that. And I love my children, and I love my wife. Yeah. And 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 I think 
just being able to feel that is important. I think the other part for me is then putting kindness into action, mm-hmm. not just not just meditative, but putting kindness into action mm-hmm. by going out every day mm-hmm. saying, how can I be kind today? Yes, yes. And that's, it's simple things. It's opening doors for people. Yes. It's not getting mad when somebody cuts in front of you in traffic. Um, mm-hmm. Just keeping it simple and being kind. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. So that's the the practice um, in order to to realize that in, in our daily living. It, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think of meditation. Some people, they think uh, of meditation as something to just to ease their own pain, emotional, psychological pain, mm-hmm. to be at peace with themselves. But they don't mm-hmm. take that into the world. Um, they kind of, they're right. doing just for themselves to, um, to be at peace. Right. I think you need the both. I agree. Yes. Yeah. That's another beautiful message. Gosh, you have so many messages, uh, wisdom really in your book, timeless wisdom, as I call it. Mm. So thank you. Um, we're almost at the end again, but I want to mention also another lesson that caught my attention was the, uh, the wild at heart. You say to be fully human means not solely accepting the artifacts of civilization, it is also accepting our wild selves to see us as part of the natural world. Uh, yeah, I would go one step further and say seeing ourselves as the natural world, uh, mm-hmm. not just a part part of, but right, we, lovely. We are right. it. As we are it. Yes. Uh, wow, what a that was another reminder, beautiful reminder for me to to be more wild. I, I try not to be. It seems like I keep holding myself right. back. I can't be that. Yeah, way. we're taught not to yeah. be. We are absolutely taught not to be. Right. Yeah. And then um, another one that caught my attention, which has to do with my dog. I tend to feed him cheese, so I think I'll stop that right away. <laughs> it was the the lesson about the coyote uh, fit. Where you say, oh, coyote, yeah, fit. Right. right? Right. Your dog should look like a healthy coyote. Coyote. Kind of don't, don't know. Right. I'm trying to pronounce that word. I, I think I don't use that word often. I actually don't. <laughs> coyote. Right. Yeah. That that was a reminder for me because I give him cheese. My husband doesn't. So I'll stop doing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you right. Here. Right. It's a lesson for me. Right. Uh, <laughs> God, and then uh, I love the way you say another one here, so many, uh, calm human. I don't want to disclose the whole book, but so many caught my attention. <laughs> calm human, right. calm human, calm dog. Right. We reflect, right? right? Dogs, dogs mirror our emotions. Mm-hmm. They're very good at, at understanding and mirroring our emotions. So when you're excited and you're agitated, your dog is going to be excited and agitated. Mm-hmm. So if you want your dog to be calm, it starts with being calm ourselves. Yes. Yes, uh, that's an, another one, another one, another one. And it, sometimes it's the other way around. I have heard people saying that the dog, yeah, well, oh, yeah, the dog mimic our emotions. Right, that's exactly what she said. I interviewed this woman. She right. was a dog whisperer, dog healer, and mm-hmm. she said mm-hmm. that. Uh, animal healer, actually. She also works with the horses. Mm-hmm. So, yes, yeah. And something else, of course, we've been talking about empathy, right? Kindness is very much a reflection of that. Empathy. So that's one of the, wow, um, to me, one of the biggest lessons in your book, too. So get down on your belly and investigate the tall glass, grass. <laughs> the right. tall, that was, yes, I was right. laughing immediately when I saw that, too. Right. Um, yes, see what your dog sees. Yeah. Yes, right. Um, that's the way you, um, you talk about empathy there. It's just so clear to me, beautifully written uh, as, a, as a truth <clears throat> to live by. Um, and then, uh, gosh, or she's just full of wisdom. <laughs> How can I ever stop talking to you? I'm trying like, wait a minute. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh my God. Yeah. The dog, how to be old. That's another one. That's, uh, yeah, it's another lesson about how to engage, um, death, right? How to embrace death, how to, how to see that, that unfolding. So Nelly was one of your dogs. You said Nelly was my uh, my how to be old teacher. So talk to Correct. me a, a moment right. about Nelly and also what's the sure. biggest lesson you, you learned about grief and death? I think with Nelly, um, she had, um, she lost an eye to cancer when she was eight. She had to have surgery uh, for an ACL tear in her, her, uh, one of her legs. Um, and she had to be left at the vet um, to be, kept in a kennel because she couldn't move around. Um, 
but and every time we came back to get her, she was happy to see us. Um, mm-hmm. She was joyful mm-hmm. um, and she was stoic. Mm-hmm. And, and what Nelly taught me was mm-hmm. that as long as I'm with my people, I'm going to go on, mm-hmm. right? As long as I'm not alone, as long as I'm with my family, I'm going to go on. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really powerful because mm-hmm. she took it with, su- she just accepted it with such grace, yes. right? Um, and then, and then one night, this is in January of 2020 during, at the beginning of the pandemic, we knew she was, she had a mass in her belly and we knew it was approaching her time, but Nellie always liked to be outside. Yeah. She liked to be sleep outside, especially when it was snowing, mm. when there's a lot of snow on the ground, she wanted to sleep outside. Oh. So, um, yeah. one night she <laughs> went out and she was sleeping outside on our patio and I woke up the next morning and she had passed. But she, but she had, but I know she was in in a place that she loved being. She loved being with us. She wasn't alone, and I thought that's kind of how I want to be when I when I come. You know, when my time comes, I want to be with my family. But I would love to be able to to be to pass away outside under the stars, um, and that's what she taught me. Yeah, gosh, yeah, it made me emotional now. Ah, uh, yes, right. Um... Wow. No, I didn't expect that. I don't cry as often here. Sometimes <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, yeah, wow, it's that's fine. beautiful. Right? I remember uh, here somebody said, you know, I want to die alive. And I think mm, that's, I love yeah, that. that might be, right. yeah, that might be what um, she did, right? Right. I love being right. here, so I'll die this way. That's where I feel alive. Right. That's ah, that's beautiful. Oh my God, Hirsch, thank you so much for that. Let me calm down first so I can speak. <laughs> I can't stop crying. Uh, mm. That's. I guess it kind of what comes to me is uh, how wonderful it would, would be uh, seeing. Everyone living this way. Mm. Um, kind of reflecting more on death, that this is a, this experience is, is temporary. So why mm. not if we mm. talk more about death and this mm. with it? Why not? I mean, mm. I love conversations about death. And I think it's because of right. its depth. It just brings us to, to you know, straight to truth. It doesn't... It exactly. doesn't take shortcuts. Exactly. <laughs> it's just exactly. so powerful. Ah, wow. Thank you so much again for your beautiful presence and sure. your shared reality. Thank you. So with this, I have to close. Well, thank yeah. you so much for having me. I'd love me. to end this way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. would you like to add anything else, Hirsch, that you left unsaid or read a passage in your book? Well, I, I think, I think the, the gist of our conversation is it's, it's a miracle that we're here and it's a miracle that we get to share our lives with dogs. Um, and I never, never, never want to take a dog for granted. They just bring me so, so much joy and happiness. Um, and the, the idea that death exists um, is, is why we have to bring joy to our lives mm-hmm. and we ha- why we have to end um, every, do everything we can to end suffering. It's because it, in the end, we all die. And that's what makes life so sweet. That's what makes life so sweet. And so I, I think taking a few moments every day to kind of reflect on that will really help you live a better life. Yes. Billion. Ah, yes. To that. Yes. Yes. I remember I interview a lot of people. So I do interview people that have lost their own children at a young age. Mm-hmm. And I remember crying here mm-hmm. too with them because even though it had been so many years since they had passed, I I, mm. I could feel in, in their pain how much they loved. I think that's what I felt, the love. Be, the deeper we love, <laughs> the deeper we will feel the pain, let's say. the mm-hmm. uh, Not the absence of love. It seems like it's another expression of love. It really does. That's what it felt to me. Mm. Another expression of Mm -hmm. love. Uh, Just listening to their grief. 
in, and I say listening mm. because um, just the silence too. They it talked a lot to me. Yes, the, the right. silence and the way they cried. Um, Wow, and now the way you speak um, about Nelly and I mean your book and everything that you're doing is just so meaningful. Thank you again, Hirsch, for being you, for being open to life to this extent. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So we'll be in touch again. And I want to mention your website is hirschwilson.com. I'll have that on the podcast notes. They'll be clickable. I'll have the Amazon link to the books, although you do suggest the collected works uh, to buy from the right. store. I have, I'll have that link there too, actually. I'll have that link instead, actually. <laughs> Oh great. But, great! Yeah, I'll have I'll have the books all linked to collected works, but um, I want to mention that's great. also on Amazon, just in case people want to buy from there. Yes, yes. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Hirsch. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Hirsch Wilson and his work, please visit hirschwilson.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.